Good morning, distinguished guests, Norwich faculty, and students. Welcome to the 11 o'clock session of the Military Writer Symposium. From virtual footprints to boots on the ground, information warfare and practice. During this panel, we'll hear from three distinguished individuals with experience ranging from hands-on information warfare operations to writing and implementing doctrine. Starting from my left, we have Colonel St Scott Nelson, U.S. Army retired. Colonel Nelson spent 32 years in the Army, concluding his career serving as the Director of Academic Engagement for the U United States Cyber Command and Deputy Chief of Staff of Operations, G3 for Army Cyber Command. Colonel Nelson also had, has held executive positions in private security companies. Sitting to the right of Colonel Nelson is Dr. Diane Zori. Dr. Zori is a senior fellow at the Global and National Security Institute at the University of so South Florida, specializing in Gulf politics, U.S. foreign policy, defense strategy, and maritime cybersecurity. Dr. Zori received her PhD in political science from George Mason University, among other degrees. Prior to her career in academia, Dr. Do Dr. Zori excuse me, served as a United States Air Force officer. Seated to her right is Colonel, Colonel Kurt Boyd, U.S. Army retired. Colonel Boyd is currently serving as the Director of Training, Doctrine, and Proponacy at the JFK Special Warfare S Center and School. His career prior to this includes extensive work in our nation's special operations entities. Colonel Boyd's military tenure stretched for 27 years, much of it in psychological operations. Especially notable is that Colonel Boyd is a 1984 alumni of Norwich University. Please give me a round of applause for our panelists. My name is Isabella Ross, and I'm a senior within the Corps of Cadets. My experience in information warfare extends from being an information warfare research intern for the past year and a half with Nuwari, the Norwich University Applied Research Institute. During this time, I've studied many different regions and the impact of adversarial malign influence campaigns. I'll be moderating this session with Cadet Will Bazant. Good morning, my name is Cadet Will Bazant. I'm also a senior in the Corps of Cadets. I'll be commissioning in the Marine Corps this spring, and my experience in information warfare comes through the lens of my experience studying through the Norwich University Peace and War Center abroad and my time working as a police officer in central Vermont. I'm looking forward to enabling a great dialogue this morning. To start the panel off, we have a question for the group and a total of 10 minutes for all answers. The title of this year's Military Writer Symposium is Perception Wars, the Battle Control Reality. In your respective opinion, how do you believe the U.S. is combating the issue of adversarial influence through media and cyber domains? And what more does the DOD and universities need to do to provide the U.S. with the best trained professionals? Uh, before we do that, though, I'd like to um, address Colonel Nelson if you'd like to give an introduction on some of the terms and terminology we could use to better understand this panel. Sure. So thanks very much. Uh, I, I have a very distinguished panel here, and I'm the less distinguished of the, of the group. So uh, it's, it's sort of fun to be back at Norwich University. Um, and I do have a, a freshman at Virginia Tech, don't, don't boo yet, uh, who is in the Corps of Cadets, and he's learning how really short haircuts and a lot of discipline is really challenging. So if you're rooks out there, I understand uh, your first year is frustrating, but it gets better. Um, so, so stick with it. It's, this is a great university to be at. Um, so I, I sort of wanted to start the sort of the panel discussion and really just what uh, the last speaker talked about is sort of definitions of what are we experiencing? What is information warfare? Uh, we, we got a definition of misinformation, disinformation, uh, and propaganda, but really what is information warfare? Um, and and for, for everybody out there, it's really important to understand that information warfare is like one of these, these terms that looks like medicine. So if, if you go back to the late 19, 1800s or 1900s, uh, you know, medicine was trying to evolve as a career field and, and as, a, as a field of prof uh, profession, and it's extremely broad, right? And so just like information warfare, it's an extremely broad field. So if you are an English major, there's a role for you in information warfare, and especially if you're a foreign language uh, uh, major, there's a role for you. If you're studying history, there's a role for you in information warfare because it's such a broad field. Um, and it's, it's one of those fields, I will tell you, and Kurt, Kurt Boyd has had longer experience in the military than I have since being in, in, uh, in 1984. I got him convinced he's 10 years older than me. He really isn't. Um, but uh, uh, it's important to understand that you have a, a place to fit here, and this career field is going to go nowhere but up with the introduction of information uh, or artificial intelligence, th synthetic data, and synthetic uh, uh, deep fakes. We're going to start being impacted greatly by this. 
And if you look at our adversaries, they're all investing in this space, just like what General Parter said earlier, uh, in, a, in a very robust way, because they know where our fractured uh, society is and where our seams are in our government. So, you know, Department of Homeland Security and the U.S. Cyber Command, we talk, but not as talk as probably as in coordinate as well as we should. And so they see those fissures and they try to exploit those. And so let's, let's sort of define what information warfare is first. So right, right out of the doctrine, there is no defined information warfare uh, definition for, for this in, in DOD. Actually, in Joint Pub 1, it doesn't define what information warfare is. So I, I, I stole something that, uh, that AI actually gave me, uh, because you know AI is always accurate. Um, so information warfare refers to the strategic use of information to gain competitive advantage, often through cyber operations, psychological operations, and electronic warfare. All right, so now if you can sort of see that, we, we, we define those into three different specific domains, right? So you've got airspace, land, uh, and, and then you have cyberspace, and then you have the information environment. So in the information environment, which is in this, in this room here, we have an information environment. We have speakers, we have physical, a physical domain, and the physical domain is the things you can actually see and, and the, where information is transposed. Uh, and then we have, on, underneath that, you have the cognitive domain, which is the human beings making decisions about the information they're seeing, and in between the physical and the cognitive is the information domain. It's the way that the mediums and the way the information flows. So we're speaking, so we have a language. It's part of the, the, the medium that's in the, in the uh, information domain. We have electrons on the back screen here, our information domain and images. Oh, those are part of the, the places that we can actually fight this thing uh, called inf the information environment in a, in a place called information warfare. So I just wanted to give that sort of context uh, to understand two major points. One is this thing is actually definable. Uh, and, and though whack-a-mole is way, the way we actually engage in the government, unfortunately, right now, uh, there is a way to define this. And so looking at strategic intent of our adversaries, it's very important to understand what is their intent. And if you understand the adversary's intent, then you actually can go after that intent with offensive and defensive means. Um, and so I just wanted to lay that out um, before we got started with the panel to sort of discuss this in a, in a, on a level playing field. Colonel, thank you. We're going to circle back to you at the end for more questions uh, aimed at you. Um, Colonel Boyd, if you could give your answer to our first question, if you'd like me to restate it, I can. The title of this year's Military Writer Symposium is Perception Wars, the Battle to Control Reality. In your respective opinions, how do you believe the U.S. is combating the issue of adversarial influence through media and cyber domains? And what more does the DOD and the universities need to do to provide the U.S. with the best trained professionals? Alumni, what then happens to you, and what is the kind of road ahead going to look like? And I'll just sum it up um, with regard to what happened uh, this summer. Uh, this summer, I had the pleasure of five Norwich interns coming down and participating with us at the Special Warfare Center for what amounted to um, an integration with all the staff at the United States Army Special Operations Command there at Fort Liberty. And in the to a person, uh, they, they couldn't have done it better, that the inter integration there was absolutely extraordinary and um, a great deal of um, accolades and so forth. And I want to mention who these people are, just so in the event that you see them around campus, uh, please talk to them, ask them hey, about their experience, and then try to do it again for us this summer. We'd like to see other people come back you know, and engage um, with, with our units um, and do it for real. And then to, to bring it home inside of uh, what is information warfare? Um, we had the pleasure of actually embedding um, two of the cadets inside of our 8th Psychological Operations Group, um, which is the group that does um, global dissemination and, of course, touches um, what is this mis-disinformation problem. In addition, we had one of the other cadets um, embedded within our regular warfare proponent uh, that we've now assumed responsibility for for the Army. And in, in irregular warfare, the piece that certainly touches the things that we're discussing today um, is counter threat finance. And, and so this person had the benefit of being embedded 
um, with the team as they develop training for the remainder of the force and see where this is going uh, for the Department of Defense. So absolutely extraordinary. So the five individuals that participated, the first is just uh, Teresa Antonio, uh, the second is Jonathan Cavaliniario, um, <laughs> Kyle Dunn, uh, Lin Lin Linua Lu, and Garrett Mack. Are any of these people here? If they are, please stand up. All right, well unfortunately they're not, but have the, if you have the opportunity to run across them um, around campus, please question them on their, their activities at Fort Liberty this, this past summer. It's absolutely exceptional. And then with regard to the question, I'll just keep it brief. I'm not sure that we are um, exact, exactly participating offensively in a manner um, in which uh, the previous speaker, you, uh, Nina, had elaborate, elaborated on, in that we need to participate actively in disinformation and we need to not be on the defense, we need to go on the offense. So the issue of adversarial influence through media and cyber um, domains, I'll offer that at least not in a manner in which I think the question assumes. A whole of government, as we already heard, and really a whole of nation is, should be the approach, a unified and common vision of some sort, as well as a common narrative, and I think later on this evening we'll discuss some more of that. Given the roles of our many departments in our government, um, today we'll focus our comments, really my, my comments strictly on the Department of Defense, and please know that you know, my thoughts do not represent uh, the Department of Defense itself. These are many of my own personal opinions. All right, please. Thank you, Colonel. Uh, and I spoke to Cadet Cavallaro about his experience this summer, and he said it was inc an incredible opportunity. So, Dr. Zori. Uh, thank you, C Cadet Bazant, for the amazing question, and thank you for the introduction, Cadet Ross. So the way I look at this is, so for the first question, how do I believe the U.S. is combating adversarial influence? This is a new domain of warfare, and as you know, in the other domains of warfare, we have mastered the art of maneuver. We have not mastered the art of maneuver in this domain. We're still working on it. We're still working on defining what we're doing, coming up with a common lexicon. But some things remain ephemeral, offensive and defensive. I would say on the defensive side in this domain, we're doing our job. We're educating cyber practitioners. We are, um, you know, correcting mistakes that are online. We are doing attribution. We could probably do more of that. Um, but the enemy does seem to be inside of our OODA loop. And I, have you heard of the OODA loop, John Boyd? Observe, orient, decide, act. So the enemy seems to have penetrated this. Now on the offensive side, I will just look at it from the strategic and the tactical. We definitely do things offensively at the tactical level. And so that would be things like deception, okay? We're not gonna necessarily let our enemy know where we are. We might do a deception campaign to make us seem like we're in a different spot, okay? Especially during a very kinetic conflict, all right? You can imagine doing a deception, the, boat, the, the ship is here, or is it here, or is it somewhere else? We're doing this pretty good. Now, at the strategic level, I would argue we are not doing a good job. And it's mainly because disinformation at the strategic level counters US values, okay? So what's the best thing we can do at the strategic level, and I'll probably talk about this a little bit more later, is to tell the truth, to completely tell the truth, all right? Now to the second point in the question, what does the DOD um, and what do universities need to do more in this space? Well, I would argue, um, you know, there will be thought leaders and Norwich is definitely a thought leader in this space in terms of coming up with a curriculum to educate. Um, you're gonna see, I think, across um, the educational enterprise um, within the United States, more focus on public, uh, uh, more focus on, I'm sorry, critical thinking. So I'm already seeing that in some places in the United States at public schools is this focus on critical thinking, teaching people how to think critically. Um, beyond that, I think it's really difficult to do things 
um, as a whole of government, not to say it's impossible, but our country is really big. And so there's countries that do this really, really well, and we've done some things to model what they're doing in our country. But I think it's gonna take place more at the state and local government level is to you know educate uh, people on how to, to see through some of these nefarious, uh, deceptive tactics that are being used against us in our, uh, in our democracy. So, so I'm gonna go sort of focus more on the, on the university piece and really sort of think about a roadmap uh, that Norwich could use, and you're already doing a lot of this. So we, you know, we started talking about the definition of, of, of information warfare. We have cyber operations, you have programs in cyber operations, you have programs in cyber defense, cyber security, uh, and now you're launching programs in artificial intelligence, uh, deep fakes and, and uh, synthetic uh, media is gonna be another important place to look. And then the, the whole idea of quantum computing is gonna be important as we look at the future. And that, and that really gets into the, this idea of, uh, of the physical dimension of cyberspace uh, and how do, how do you map that out. The, the next thing is uh, you need to start looking at programs, especially in your social sciences programs, right? So anthropology, uh, sociology, economics, uh, and political science all fit very well into this space. And one of the things that I've seen, and, and you've heard the panelists all talk about it, is this is an ill-defined place, especially in the Department of Defense. Uh, we found the term mis- and disinformation so challenging politically that we, we come up with our own term, which is foreign malign influence. And we focus, because of our title uh, authorizations, only Title 10 and Title 50, we can focus only on foreign threats. So hence, foreign malign influence makes sense. But if you start thinking about foreign malign influence and defining that, how, how do you go back to this definitional aspect of it and look at your curriculum and your, and your programs that can exist in how we break down those threat actors and how they operate? So, so Kurt talked about threat finance as an example, right? So uh, most of the speakers have talked about, well, how do, how do these organizations in these other countries actually operate? Finance is a big part of that. So if we look at how we took down the terrorist organizations during Operation Iraqi Freedom and, and Operation Enduring Freedom, uh, we, we hit them hard with the, cutting off their finances, right? So we understood how they were using the internet to finance their operations and we targeted those things. How do we do the same thing for the foreign malign influence threats that we face in our country? Uh, we actually have to actually understand our adversary and I don't think we do very well. Uh, we don't understand the Russia uh, connection between the GRU and the FSB and how this foreign malign influence actually functions, how they use the Russian business networks to operate against us so they have some sort of attribution uh, uh, obf obfuscation when it comes to how they actually execute uh, influence in our country. They understand us better than we understand them in a lot of ways. The Chinese are, are an emerging threat. Their, their focus right now is economic for the most part, but if you look at their th three wars doctrine, they certainly have sp psychological operations and they see the United States through their lens of Desert Storm and the, and the fall of, uh, of the Berlin Wall and their experience with Tiananmen Square in 1989 through this idea of a foreign actor influencing their country, and that's a big threat to our centralized authoritarian government. And so we have to sort of see the lens to our adversaries uh, and, and the way they view the world to be able to, go to counteract these things. And then we have to be offensive. So we can't just do the whack-a-mole idea uh, of just countering somebody's speech in, on the internet. We have to actually go after the infrastructure, as we talked about, the information environment that exists, the physical aspects of how they actually operate to put in, mis- and disinformation into our sphere of influence. Uh, how do we target that from a physical perspective? So that's offensive cyber operations, that's threat finance. Uh, that's actually going after the physical individuals that are doing this stuff or, con or commanding controlling that. Uh, and then we need to look at the information itself. How do we target that? So that means going after the server farms, going after the AI networks they're using, et cetera. And then finally, how do we then create a re resiliency in our country, as Diane talked about, in, in, in this idea of resilience and critical thinking of, of our individual uh, uh, Americans as well as, as our military members, right? So we, the United States military, need to realize that we're actually a massive threat here uh, when it comes to foreign malign influence, targeting just what General Potter said, if you're using um, you know, uh, foreign malign influence against our, our female senior officers that are leading organizations uh, and using synthetic data to do things against them, it's, rumors are, are a massive way to target 
uh, the, the, the credibility of, of a person, and if you take down the command and control, you have a massive impact on the morale of that organization. So these are all things that we need to think about from an offensive, defensive perspective that we don't do that today. And unfortunately, I've been in this space for 25 years. Kurt has been in a little longer than me. Uh, but we've always had to fight an upward battle with, with credibility in this information warfare, this, this war fighting domain that we're in. Uh, and we're not, we're not really getting the level of resources or focus uh, that an F-22 or an F-35 or an Abrams tank has or whatever else, drone technology, cyber, even cyber today is billions of dollars of investment. And I will tell you our form line influence investment is going down and the priorities are even taken off in the Army side uh, for, for USASOC to do what their, what their mission is. So, you know, where are the priorities and is this really a problem from our leaders' perspective that our leaders see. And, and I, can, I can have a lot of very strong opinions with general officers out there uh, that I don't think the way that we educate them uh, to understand this space is, is what it needs to be. It needs to get much stronger and better. They need to see it for what it is. Uh, and it can't be just going into a war zone all of a sudden, hey, this is a big problem. And they come back to the United States, oh, it's not a big problem anymore. I, want, I need to invest in modernization. We need, to, we need to understand that this problem is global and it's impacting us constantly. Sir, thank you. Colonel Boyd, uh, this next question is more oriented towards uh, the title of our uh, seminar today and takes a little bit of stage setting. In May of this year, U.S. Green Berets in Sweden conducted a mock raid and intelligence gathering mission on a building. What was notable about the raid was the inclusion of organic cyber warfare capabilities at the team level. An ODA, or operational detachment, in the vicinity of the objective forcibly entered the Wi-Fi network and exploited it by unlocking doors and manipulating CCTV cameras, thus enabling the entry team to complete their mission with ease. Cyberspace is a complex environment and requires extensive training to dominate. Is it realistic or desirable to make every combat armed service member a cyber expert in addition to the extensive training they already go through? All right, I'm gonna break this down into a few pieces. Before I start though, let me comment uh, briefly on the, the notion of doctrine. Um, so that people don't start with an aversion to it, because um, more often than not, uh, people, when they say that, then the next thing they say is, do we really have to read it, and do we have to learn it? And, and the answer is absolutely yes. And in my current, I guess, position, my, my task is, of course, to make it more consumable, to bring it into the 21st century, and to give it to future operators with a capacity to to be able to communicate more effectively. And, and that's internally, right? And of course, externally, people can read our doctrine and learn about what we do. But to know and understand on the surface of what it is, it is a description of the force. So currently, the Army today has Field Manual 3-0, um, which is referred to as operations, and that is their capstone doctrine for how to conduct multi-domain operations. The future of Army warfare involves air, land, sea, space, cyber, and information, and so on. And, and then there is similarly uh, dimensions that nest under that, uh, which are critically important to you, that some of you have already begun discussing and we're discussing today, and the notion of the information, human, and physical dimensions. And the Army essentially created this book um, so that it can change the future of the Army, um, and for one, one very important reason, uh, that over the course of the last 20 years, it participated in the global war on terror, and it retooled itself to be effective at conducting counterterrorism and counterinsurgency. But it now looks to the future, what does it see? It sees the capacity to continue to do those, right, at small scale, but understands that the true threat is much more daunting and large. And so they coined the term large-scale combat operations. You can expect to hear more about multi-domain operations in the future, uh, because the Army also has recognized that it doesn't go to war by itself. It goes to war as a joint force. It's inherently joint, much like SOF has always been, and so therefore it will communicate that way in the future. And that's very good um, for the information component, uh, because also the Army recognizes that central to operations is the notion of information. And they actually invested over the course of the last number of years the development of their own doctrine in that regard, which is publication 313, um, Information Advantage, which is what you, you stated. Um, so it, with that, so that you just kind of understand kind of what the, the background is to all this, 
And the notion of what Diane had mentioned with regard to maneuver is absolutely true. General Potter mentioned it, that with regard to the information space, you can certainly help me, help us in the future if you're thinking in that, that way, right? That it's not just in the physical space that we conduct maneuver, it is also in the information space, and they both play off one another, all right? And then with regard to this particular question, of course, I asked immediately, can I really comment on this? Um, this is 10th Special Forces Group. Do you know why it's 10th Special Forces Group? Anybody? Why was it created? It was created in 52 because we had a peer competitor that was concerned about what special operations forces might do. And it, the 10th group was created. Why? Is there nine other groups? No, right? So what did that tell you, right? So it offered at least a little bit of a question in people's minds as to what the potential is for the United States military and the use of special operations to conduct various operations, both inside and outside of combat. So I unpacked this question into four pieces, and I'll, eat, I'll hit each, um, just one after the other, if that's all right. Um, so the notion of having a working knowledge of space. So what I'll offer there is um, the other task that I have at the Special Warfare Center and School is training. So all things training in the institution, making Green Berets, psychological operations, and civil affairs soldiers uh, for the Army. But we do it at various levels. And at the various levels in which we teach it, initial entry being one, in some respects like you here in an academic institution, and the things that you need to do to matriculate through and acquire your degree. Same, same as to acquire a military occupational specialty or a branch. And so we have that branch training um, for SF, Civil Affairs, and PSYOP. And then likewise, on top of that, we have professional military education, which is layered in on top of the, the initial entry training to train leaders. So Army-wise, they have what is called office, officer education system, and on the NCO side, they have the NCO education system. Both of those are um, really uh, process-driven, it's aligned to where we create um, a certain level of curriculum, even in the civilian sector. So the notion of having training and education outlines or outcomes, uh, those exist, as well as a certain curriculum that gets accredited uh, by our own institution and, uh, and others included. And then similarly, e each level of our education and training, we also seek academic and industry credential. So in most of the training that we conduct at the Special Warfare Center and School can be aligned with certain academic credentialing and then similarly um, with civilian credentialing. I'll mention that as background to the next comment. And so the comment on the notion of space. So currently the Army is doing a, a total review of where it is in its training. And why is this? Because as I said, 20 years of the global war on terror, some of those skills and abilities the Army has lost, right? the ability to navigate through the woods using a compass. Wow, what an idea. Well, when you went to Iraq and Afghanistan, eh, you know, wasn't so wooded. Wasn't really a big problem, right? And so, the, and, and you had, what, devices. And what did we do in Iraq and Afghanistan? We eliminated much of the communications architecture, so we owned most of it. So it wasn't a real issue. So the, so the bottom line is, today, you know, we're getting back to basics. The whole idea within the special operations community is, absolutely must be brilliant at the basics, no question. And then we move from there. So what does, what does that have to do then with the introduction of space? You can't do global communications without it, right? And so therefore, if space or the Navy or the Air Force wants to be expeditionary, they gotta be touching space, right? And so therefore, our people at the tactical level will have some knowledge of it, the degree in which they're manipulating it, you know, we're not gonna publish that you know, so that you, we can talk about it in this auditorium. But, but the bottom line is that space is ubiquitous and, and we need to incorporate it basically from the ground up. And we need to understand from the operator back why that's essential. Because in the past, right, we have had a difficult time pushing information to the edge, right, where it ne it's, it's absolutely needed. So therefore, the, the, essentially the intelligence picture is made available, right, to the lowest common denominator. As, as it comes available. So that's, that's my comment with regard to space and where it should end up. 
And then can we introduce cyber at the tactical level as it relates to an operational detachment alpha? Um, within special forces, there's a 12-person detachment. It's led by a, a captain. Um, he is the detachment commander. He has an ops warrant. Um, also helping him with the leadership of that, that detachment. And then there's 12 NCOs. Those 12 NCOs are made up of communications, engineering, medical, and weapons expertise. Um, within that structure, um, they also, of course, acquire all the latest and advanced techniques and te technologies that are being made available. You can imagine, you know, today with regard to robotics and unmanned systems, is there a need? And of course there is. Is there a need that's actually happening, you know, within the maneuver center? And are they doing things with regards to that? Absolutely. So we're all sharing in, in the advancements of those technologies. However, to create what is cyber expertise and put it on an ODA and make it organic, that's a whole different question. As I said, initial entry training and then professional military education, that, that we do for those particular skills. The cyber training occurs at the cyber center, right? Their center of excellence. And, and we don't need to get into that as far as um, who's crossing streams. The task currently is theirs. And if we need that requirement within special forces or within civil affairs or psychological operations, we task organize. Every commander has the, the flexibility to do that and we actually ex execute it, again, at the lowest level. Give people what they affectionately call bolt-ons. So if you want to have an image, you know, it's like Legos. We're going to stick you know, other skill sets and make them available to a particular team, right, so they can execute various missions in a, in a particular environment. The other thing to pay, take note of, the globe, right, while we all want to make it you know, a hobby just one kind of thing, one size fits all, it's not that way, right? We have regionalized these special forces capabilities and, and apply those particular technologies uniquely to those regions because they are not all the same. And so we have to address that. Two other pieces and then I'll get off mic here. Um, the training pipeline, there was a comment in this about the length. The other thing that people get concerned with is, gosh, it takes forever to train these guys. Uh, the truth of the matter is it takes a year, right? That's one time through. How many people make it one time through? Very few. Right? Why is that? Because it's hard. And why is it hard? Because it has to be because the reliance on these folks is that they can perform their skills without access right, to a great deal of support. Right? They're out there on the edge. The whole idea of, you know, read the books, behind enemy lines, that's who you can expect to be there. And so we need to ensure that they have the, the appropriate mental aptitude as well as the physical and then, of course, the skill. And that's what we deliver and, and provide to them through a years long training. Now, they recycle and come back through and are they successful? Most of them are, absolutely, because why? Because we're supposed to train them. They've already been selected, they're gonna go through the training, it's our task to train them. So that's, that's, that's how we deal with it. So the other thing about that is at the center in school, people get all kind of enamored with the notion of, hey, I can do this halo, the high, high altitude jumping, I can do dive school, I can do all these advanced skills, certainly. But you need to get proficient at the basic skills first, be assigned to a unit, and come back to us, and then, then you have the benefit of going through those specialized schools. And the last point, um, and then the, the thing that I'll also make, make, you, you know, make you aware of is um, within the community itself, the other, other aspect of where SOF has been over the years is, is SOF has found itself um, independently co conducting various operations um, in a way that the Army is unaware. So the expectation is now that particularly with an Army SOF that we will be nested with the Army and out there and conducting operations with them so that they can benefit right from the abilities of special operations more so than they have done in the past. The historical record is not good um, with regard to where special operations sits post-conflict um, and so therefore in order to repair that uh, we need to bind ourselves with the Army, and that's where we're head with our, headed with our own doctrine. Thank you. Sir, thank you. Dr. Zori, if you could take five minutes and answer the following question, uh, which I find especially interesting because earlier you spoke about how the U.S. competing at the strategic level in this field is actually immoral in some ways. Um, so I ask you this. Depending on their cognitive frame of mind, the, the average American might view the U.S. government today and throughout the late 20th century as either a reckless violator of the international order, an example being the post-9-11 CIA torture program, 
or to the contrary, an enforcer of the rules-based global order, um, the liberation of Kuwait being an example. In this breath, do you believe the U.S. government is too hesitant in our employment of irregular and information warfare? And if so, what solutions might you offer? That is a fantastic question. So I would posit that the enemy is inside our OODA loop, observe, orient, decide, act, and we are observing this and we are orienting to the threat, but we have not yet decided on what to do and how to act. So who is the enemy? Okay, I would posit that we've got four, four big ones. You've got Russia and China and Iran and North Korea. Those are our big four. Uh, what do we do about this? Okay, they've, they've jumped in, they're on the offensive at the strategic level inside this domain, and we're not sure what to do. So I would, I would go back to the basics. What does Sun Tzu say? He says, know your enemy and know yourself. All right, so how well do we know Korean, Chinese, Russian, Persian, Farsi, Urdu, do we know, do, do we understand these cultures? I would venture to say that in all of these places, there's many more people that speak English than there are people that speak Chinese or Russian here. They know us. They know our social cleavages. They might know us in some ways better than, they, than we know ourselves because they're very objective about it. They're not American. Um, you know, I, I would say, what do we do about it? Um, and America, I think, is growing in this space. And I had the unique privilege, uh, maybe it was fortune or misfortune, to live in a country for the past two years. I recently moved. I would call it a light authoritarian country. But even in a very light authoritarian country, you see things like the total censorship of any information that counters that country's regime. You see the total censorship of reality, okay? I lived in a country where they constantly told us there was no crime, none, zero, okay? Now, is that humanly possible? Everything was censored. We had a major flood, all right? And it was devastating to the country, but nobody died, nobody, nobody was hurt. Everything was fine, okay? It was not fine. It was not fine at all. So I would say you should be very proud, and, and sometimes you have to step out of your country or your framework or your bubble to, to see it. And I know my, my kids learned a lot from this experience, maybe even more than I did, is we're very lucky to be Americans, and we should be very proud of that, all right? We are a free and democratic country, but know yourself. All right, there was this movie that came out in 2002, and you've, you're probably gonna laugh when I tell you what it is, maybe you've seen it. It was called Eight Mile, and it was about a famous rapper named Eminem. Now, I really like this movie, because at the end, he gets in a rap battle with someone who was very good, but he, he, he won that rap battle. How did he win the rap battle? He won it by being very, very true to who he was and admitting everything about himself. So much so that his opponent really couldn't say anything, okay? So if we are really going to be honest in this new era of information, we need to be honest about who we are because the world knows, and at the end of the day, we know as well. We know how America was founded. We know our dirty laundry. We know all of it. But we also know that we are a great country that's working to become a more perfect union. We're not perfect. We're not an authoritarian country that's pretending to be perfect or that's putting up a Potemkin village. We know that we have dirty laundry. We know we have things that we need to work on. And the enemy gets inside those cleavages and tries to divide us. But I think by being completely truthful, the truth will always come out, okay? But by completely owning the good, the bad, and the ugly, that's how we can go forward in this new era, this new information era. Thank you very much, Doctor. Colonel Nelson, our final, our final questions are directed at you, um, and we have two of them. First, 
based on your extensive experience with information warfare and cyber, how do you predict adversarial influence will develop, and how will it change the way that military and strategic planners view the world? Um, and secondly, based on your military and academic experience, how would you recommend students and adults alike begin to educate themselves on IW and adversarial influence operations outside of Norwich University's information warfare minor? Are there certain topics we should give more time to studying? So, so I'll start with the first one, um, and I'll make it relatively simple. I think it's just going to be more robust. There will be a lot more velocity, so it will be coming at us at rap more rapid speed. Uh, they'll know a lot more about us. Uh, artificial intelligence is a, is a game changer. Uh, it is the new internet, and that's just a fact. Uh, it's a technology that's going to modernize uh, the way we look and how we act amongst each other. Uh, you won't be able to tell the difference between a synthetic uh, voice on a phone and an artificial intelligence, right, or, na or a, a natural one. So, so that's going to cause significant changes. The great thing about our country, again, is, is, is uh, Diane said, is we're a robust entrepreneur country, so we can come up with defenses to a lot of this, right? We, we're de we are the, 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 the world leaders, regardless of what the Chinese tell you, in, in artificial intelligence. Uh, we have private industry doing that, and it's a global effort. Uh, it's not just the United States doing it. It's, it's meta, uh, 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 open, open AI, um, I forgot the other two. Well, I've talked to all four of them here recently, and they're all like asking for the government to actually help them with a lot of this development, which is a good sign um, uh, versus what, you know, what we've heard about some of the, uh, the social media companies. Um, but I think what you're going to start seeing is we rapidly uh, evol ev evolution of, of information warfare against our country, especially understanding uh, the, the risks and the, the fissures we have in our society and then trying to drive wedges into those. The challenge our government will have is because we, we always say whole of government, whole of society, but we have a very hard time doing that unless we have a massive crisis, like 9-11 was an example, right? So we had a very unpopular president. If you remember, President Bush, prior to September 11, 2001, was a very unpopular president. He had just won a very controversial election, uh, and all of a sudden, his approval rating was over 80% after 9-11, right? And it stuck with him for about a year. Uh, his father the same with Desert Storm, right? He went from very poor approval ratings up to over 80%, and then he, he, he lost the next election. So, so it's a demonstration of our country's actually relatively resilient if we come together, uh, but we gotta sort of force that come, come together in this. And our, our government is a very conservative place for the most part. And when I say conservative, I don't mean this in the sense of a political orientation, I mean in the sense of change. So, so we have to figure out how do we robust the ability to, to embrace change in our, in our uh, departments and our agencies. Just, just to give you an example, what Kurt just talked about with ODAs, and we've had that discussion about how do we enhance ODAs on the tactical environment, especially in the, in the Pacific theater, when you're doing a lot of operations, isolated operations in, in island chains, right? Um, you don't have ma massive armored uh, formations that can come to rescue of an ODA. So they have to figure out how do they, pu they pluck things from other functional commands like cyber or space to enable those ODAs to function. And we got to do a better job of communicating that and, 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 and working together as an army, uh, let alone as a joint force and at other, other agencies like DHS, et cetera, and working those together. We're still sort of fractured when it comes to stove piping of our government. We got we to figure out how we sort of le level that out. And then this needs to be a defined problem in government uh, and, and sort, of, sort of set everybody's strategic directive on how we're going to solve the problem. Not a really great answer to a very complex problem, but and really more complicated problem because of our politics. Uh, but but it's the best uh, that we can work on right now, and you guys are going to be the forefront of this. And as you as you escape from Norwich University uh, in in four years or one year and join the military or join other organizations, you're going to face this problem in spades uh, coming forward. The second thing about education. Uh, I think from, from a Norwich perspective, you are on the cusp of something great. Uh, honestly, you're a small university. You're, you're actually very robust in the way you look at the problems and opportunities. You, you can't, you're just not going to compete with a Harvard with an endowment of billions of dollars. Uh, but what you do have is you have intellectual capacity in this institution to can think differently about a problem. Nobody that I've seen, I've seen very few panels uh, in DOD 
working with the universities that are talking about information warfare uh, and procession management. Um, there, there's some of it going on, but I don't see a lot of that going on and engaging the Department of Defense. Um, we need to do more of that. We need to be more of our, our leadership here at Norwich talking to you. We need to, we need to grow this into the senior military colleges so all six universities are working together with the Corps of Cadets because all six universities fill 14% of the commissioned officers across the joint force. So there's a pretty significant impact that this school and the, and the five other senior military colleges can have when it comes to influence the future uh, of, the, of the US military. The other thing I would think about is, as, as Kurt talked about the ODA challenge, how do we start getting our, in ROTC, our leaders to start talking about information warfare and do we, do we create an FTX for information warfare? Right? So you do, you do FTXs now when you go out there and maneuver in the, in, and understand maneuver warfare. Do we need to understand maneuver warfare in the information environment? Do we create that tactical level team so that team goes into that, uh, you know, a war fighting exercise, you know, and it can be a small space and you're, you're living the worst uh, day of your life when it comes to a military uh, engagement, but it's all around information inf the, and information warfare. And, and it doesn't have to be all experts in that field. It's, it's great to bring the infantry guys, infantry officer, you know, we're not the smartest people in the world. Um, uh, chemical officers, the, the communications officers, bring them in as a team and have them have to fight together to understand why this is such a hard space and, and figure out innovative solutions to do that. And those then become case studies that you use inside the classroom. Um, the final one is, I, I just want to sort of emphasize something else, and, and again, going back to the cutting age, uh, edge of, of Norwich University, uh, you guys are founding members of the, the National Center for Narrative Intelligence. Um, that just stood up here in August of, of 2023. Uh, it just got funded for con by Congress uh, for FY24, and we have an additional uh, funds coming in for 25 and beyond. The DOD CIO has taken over leadership role of that, and so you look at this and go, DOD CIO, what the heck do they care about influence? They're seeing the, the, the impact on their organization when they start talking about networks and network survivability the influence piece is becoming critically important because of the social engineering and the, the impact that AI is having now with uh, in, impacting the, the, the uh, human capital that exists in the organization. So the easiest target, if you, if, if you t take any cybersecurity courses, the easiest target is not the seven layers of the, of the information system, it's the eighth layer, or the, I don't know if it's eighth or seventh layer, is the human being, right? And so 80% of the cyber attacks that happen, I just had one today, uh, which is a, you know, a, my gas company tell me I owe more money. I don't owe you any more money, and it, just, it was a phishing attack trying to get me to call a number and put more money into, them, into their account. Um, and so, so we have to really start putting all our students into this uh, crucible of, of the information environment. Uh, and you sort of live that on a day-to-day -day basis, but how do we start doing that in the classroom in a, in a more structured perspective? And then the last piece is, is understanding, as I talked about before, how do we understand that this, this field is like medicine? It's very, very broad, and everybody has a place to fit, the historians to the, to, to the AI professionals that are developing the next learning model. All of those fit into this space. Even the psychology majors out there uh, play in the ethics of developing AI. Very important aspect of how we look at AI in the future, right? So do we want, we want terminators or something that's actually helpful to us, right? Uh, and so we, we got to think about that. And, and no, our adversaries are looking at terminators. Um, because that is a, a level playing field. You know, we don't have to use human, human beings, we use machines to, part, to fight the future wars. Um, so, so those are the things I look at the university. I think the university has some pr pretty good vision of where we need to go. Um, but I would, I, would, I would ask you to really pub publicize the things you're doing here in a, a more grandiose way uh, and, and bring more leaders like General Potter to come down and look at what they're doing and, and actually give her a briefing on here's the university's perspective on information warfare and how we're doing things in this curriculum. Thanks. Sir, thank you. Um, I, I agree that I, I think Norwich also is, is well stanced to have a bit, bigger effect on the industry in the future, uh, which is exciting, although I won't see it as a student here. Um, I apologize that we have no time for questions, but as we wrap up this panel, we would like to give thanks to our panelists for coming to campus today to share their insights on the importance of information warfare uh, for all realms of warfighters. Uh, please join me in giving them a round of applause.
Uh, we'll now break for lunch from 12 to 1300. Uh, the next program will be here in Mac Auditorium at 1300, titled Russian Information Warfare, The Battle to Control Reality. Everyone's Thank hungry. you all for your attendance. Yeah.